In this video, we shall show that the Talmud proves Catholicism. This video will show that Catholicism is the fullness of truth, and we will be showing that modern day Judaism lacks the fullness of truth that Catholicism possesses. Part 1, Isaiah 53. Now most people are aware of Isaiah 53. Let's turn to Isaiah 53. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth, Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When he makes himself an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the fruit of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. So clearly in Isaiah 53, we see that the suffering servant bears the iniquities of the whole world, and by his suffering and by his death, we are made righteous. Now clearly this applies to Jesus Christ. However, the modern Jewish interpretation is that the suffering servant actually applies to the people of Israel. So they will try to deny that it applies to the Lord Jesus Christ. They will deny that you could read Isaiah 53 as Messianic. The problem is that the Talmud says Isaiah 53 can be read as Messianic. In Sanhedrin 98b 14 we see the following. Apropos, regarding the Messiah, the Gemara asks, what is his name? The school of Rabbi Sheila says Shiloh is his name as it is stated, until when Shiloh shall come, Genesis 49.10. The school of Rabbi Yanai says, Yinin is his name, as it's stated, may his name endure forever, may his name continue, Yinin, as long as the sun, and may men bless themselves by him. The school of Rabbi Hanina says, Hanina is his name, as it's stated, for I will show you no favor, Hanina. And some say that Menahem ben Hiskia is his name, as it's stated, because the comforter, Menahem, that should relieve my soul is far from me. And the rabbi say, the leper of the house of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi is his name, as it stated, Indeed our illness he did bear, and our pains he endured. Yet we did esteem him injured, stricken by God, and afflicted. Isaiah 53, 4. End quote. So from this verse in the Talmud, we see two interesting things. First, when the rabbis are asked about the Messiah, Rabbi Sheila says Genesis 49, 10 is a messianic verse. Now keep this in the back of your mind, as this will be important shortly. Now what does Genesis 49, 10-11 say? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foal into the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washes garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Implicitly in the statement, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, until Shiloh come, is that the scepter shall depart when Shiloh comes. Now the Talmud has Rabbi Sheila asserting this is a messianic prophecy, meaning once the Messiah comes, the scepter shall depart from Judah. This is an important admission, as we shall demonstrate that the Messiah did come, and that's exactly why God has left the temple of the Jews, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Before moving on to the next point, let's also acknowledge how Genesis 49.10 parallels Psalm 118.22, which says, The stone the builders had rejected became a cornerstone. So we see here that there is a rejection of the Messiah, or the stone, by his people, the builders, and that he becomes the center of the new covenant, the cornerstone. Now before you reject this interpretation and assert that this has no connection to the Messiah, let's see what the top rabbinic theologian, Rabbi Rashi, has to say. Rabbi Rashi on Micah 5.1 says, The Messiah, son of David, and so scripture says, the stone the builders had rejected became a cornerstone. So we see that Rabbi Rashi thinks that Psalm 118.22 is messianic. Alright, now the second interesting thing about the Talmudic verse from Sanhedrin 98b is that the rabbi reads Isaiah 53 as applying to the Messiah, meaning the suffering servant who bears the iniquities of the people is the Messiah and not the people of Israel. This is a pretty big admission, considering the fact that modern rabbis would try their hardest to deny Isaiah 53 is messianic, since it clearly points towards the crucifixion and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now even if the Talmud elsewhere claims that Isaiah 53 could be read about the people of Israel, the mere fact that there's a messianic interpretation rebuts the objection that Isaiah 53 in no way can be interpreted as messianic. 
as their own top rabbis have historically approved of this interpretation. Now let's go to Midrash Tanchuma Torot 14.1. Quote, A song of ascents, I will lift up mine eyes to the mountains. Scripture alludes here to the verse, Who art thou, O great mountain, before? Zerubbabel. Thou shalt become a plain. This verse refers to the Messiah, the descendant of David. Why was he called a great mountain? Because he would be greater than the patriarchs. As it is said, Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Isaiah 52, 13. He shall be exalted above Abraham, lifted up above Isaac, and shall be very high above Jacob. He shall be exalted above Abraham, concerning whom it is said, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, lifted up above Moses, of whom it is said, that thou shouldst say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom, and shall be very high like the ministering angels, concerning whom it is said, As for their wings, they were high. Hence scripture says, Who art thou, O great mountain? Now let's read Isaiah 52:13. Isaiah 52, 13 says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. So we see here that the Talmud says Isaiah 52, 13, which is about the servant, applies to the Messiah, who is from the line of David. Once again, we see the Talmud make the connection between the servant in Isaiah and the Messiah, showing that they're one and the same figure. Furthermore, this interpretation affirms the Messiah will be exalted above all prophets, even above Moses, who knew God face to face, showing the absolute primacy of the Messiah. Great to know, since many modern rabbis would try to deny the suffering servant who is exalted is the Messiah. But as we see, the Talmud affirms this. Interestingly enough, the Targum Jonathan, which is considered authoritative for rabbinic Jews, translate the My Servant from Isaiah 52.13 as My Servant the Messiah. This demonstrates that ancient Jews saw the servant in Isaiah was a Messiah, contra modern Jewish interpretation. So we see that according to the Talmud and the Targums, the suffering servant can be interpreted as a Messiah. In other words, this is a historic and plausible interpretation of the text for the Jews. Thus, we have concluded stage one, where we simply show that the Jewish paradigm allows such Old Testament prophecies to be considered messianic. Part two, the Talmud and the miracle of the Crimson Thread. Before understanding the miracle of the Crimson Thread, we must understand the background of Yom Kippur. The Jews had a yearly sacrifice called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which was established by God in Leviticus 16 where they would sacrifice goats and confess their sins over it. And this would be a substitutionary atonement for the remission of the sins of the people. Leviticus chapter 16 verses 21 to 22 reads as follows, quote, And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities Onto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. End quote. Now the Jews had the tradition of tying a red thread to the goat, and after sacrificing it, if it miraculously turned white, they realized that God accepted their sacrifice and forgave their sins. If instead the thread remained red, then God rejected their sacrifice and did not forgive their sins. This is seen in Rosh Hashanah 31b13, which says, quote, If after the sacrificing of the offerings and the sending of the scapegoat, the strip turned white, the people would rejoice as this indicated that their sins had been atoned for. If it did not turn white, they would be sad. This tradition was based off of Isaiah 1, 18, which says, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Now we see that according to the Talmud itself, this miracle is frequently successful in the time prior to Christ. Yoma 39a 15 says the following, The sages taught during all 40 years that Shimon Hatzedek served as high priest, the lot for God arose in the right hand. From then onward, sometimes it arose in the right hand, and sometimes it arose in the left hand. Furthermore, during his tenure as high priest, the strip of crimson wool that was tied to the head of the goat that was sent to Azazel turned white, indicating that the sins of the people had been forgiven. As it is written, though your sins be as crimson, they shall be white as snow. From then onward, it sometimes turned white, and sometimes it did not turn white. Furthermore, the western lamp of the candelabrum would burn continuously as a sign that God's presence rested upon the nation. From then onward, it sometimes burned and sometimes it went out. So we see that under the high priest Simeon the Just, or Shimon Hetzedek, the crimson thread would always turn white, the lot for God would always get casted in the correct hand, and the sanctuary lamp was perpetually on. So these miracles were occurring, and quite frequently. And according to Jewish interpretation, this indicated that God was happy with the Jewish people. Furthermore, after the time of Simeon the Just, we see the Talmud says these miracles occasionally occurred, probably depending on their relationship with God. In other words, the Jewish Old Covenant sacrifices were effective before Christ, and this is confirmed in the Talmud. Both the Jewish and Catholic paradigms can account for these Talmudic accounts, 
as we both maintain the efficacy of the ritual sacrifices prior to Christ. Now here's where things get juicy. Yoma 39b 5-6 to says the following, The sages taught during the tenure of Shimon Hetzedek, the lot for God always arose in the high priest's right hand. After his death, it occurred only occasionally. But during the 40 years prior to the destruction of the second temple, the lot for God did not arise in the high priest's right hand at all. So too the strip of crimson wool that was tied to the head of the goat that was sent to Azazel did not turn white. And the westernmost lamp of the candelabrum did not burn continually. And the doors of the sanctuary opened by themselves as a sign that they would soon be opened by enemies. Rosh Hashanah 31b 17 says the following, And it is taught in Bereta, During the 40 years before the second temple was destroyed, the strip of crimson wool would not turn white. Rather, it would turn a deeper shade of red. Jerusalem Talmud Yoma 6.3 says the following, It was stated, Forty years before the temple was destroyed, was the eastern light extinguished, and the shiny strip became red, and the lot of the name came up in the left hand. They were locking the doors of the temple hall in the evening, and in the morning they found them open. So here we see in both the Babylonian and Jerusalem Talmud that odd occurrences took place forty years prior to the destruction of the second temple. Now it's a well-known fact that the destruction of the temple happened on 70 AD. So 40 years before the destruction of the second temple was around 30 AD. We see the Talmud admits that Jewish sacrifices were ineffective starting from 30 AD and leading up to 70 AD. And on 70 AD, we know that the temple would end up getting destroyed and the Jews would be left for 2,000 years without a temple, nor a priesthood, nor a sacrifice, and therefore leaving them without blood atonement for their sins, as Leviticus 16 teaches. So this event leading up to the destruction of the second temple seems fairly monumental as this is a pivotal point in the Jewish religion. Now 30 AD is an oddly familiar time for these events to start occurring. This wonderfully matches with the date that Christ came and revealed his identity as the divine Messiah and who sacrificed himself on the cross for the eternal redemption. So from 30 to 70 AD we see 1. God rejected all Yom Kippur sacrifices and the crimson thread not only remained red but turned a deeper shade of red, indicating that God was displeased with the Jewish people. 2. Every lot casted ended up in the left hand indicated it was rejected by God. 3. The sanctuary light, that was supposed to be perpetual, kept extinguishing. 4. The locked doors of the temple hall flung open every morning. Now let's think for a moment. For 40 years, the lots was casted in the left hand. 40 years in a row. Alright, now let's just consider the probability of 40 lots getting casted in the left hand in a row. There's a half probability for a single cast landing in the left hand, as it could either end up in the right hand or the left hand. Now the probability of 40 left hand cast in a row is half to the 40th power, or literally a one in a trillion probability. So this event, according to the Talmud, is clearly supernatural, and we did not even consider the probability of all the other phenomena occurring simultaneously, like the doors being locked and flinging open, and so forth. So no one can say that this is just some natural coincidence, as the likelihood of the conjunction of all these events occurring is so incredibly low. Furthermore, we have demonstrated earlier that according to the Talmud, the miracles were frequently occurring prior to Christ, increasing the prior probability of one expecting these miracles to continue occurring, all things being equal. So we see that it is reasonable that given the data mentioned in the Talmud, that one would expect these miracles to continue taking place as they were dependent on the constant rituals which were consistently effective. However, we see that these miracles not only stopped taking place, but there was a radical inverse of these miracles, where what took place was more problematic than normative state of affairs. For example, the one in a trillion probability of casting the lot, the locked door swinging open, and a red thread becoming darker red, this is unnatural. So one can say that this data is actually not expected under the Jewish model, but actively goes against what was expected on the Jewish paradigm. In the New Testament, we see that the Old Covenant sacrifices were a mere shadow for Christ the Divine Messiah's ultimate sacrifice, and therefore once the sacrifice took place, the old lesser shadows of the sacrifice disappeared forever. These Talmudic verses find their full explanation in the New Testament. This series of events makes perfect sense under the Catholic paradigm. As we know, Christ started his public ministry in 30 AD, and he would be crucified in 33 AD, and fulfill the role of the suffering servant who atones for our sins, which the Talmud admits could be interpreted as messianic. Remember that the Talmud also admits Genesis 49.10 could be interpreted as messianic, which implies that the scepter would depart from Judah when the Messiah comes, and we believe the exact thing did occur. So the Catholic paradigm has an explanation for why God rejected all the sacrifices from the Jews from 30 to 70 AD, which is because many Jews rejected their Messiah, and Christ fulfilled the ultimate sacrifice. Furthermore, the Christian paradigm also has a greater prior probability for such events occurring, since the prophecies, like Genesis 49.10, 
predicted that the scepter would depart from Judah when the Messiah came. Furthermore, we also see Psalm 118.22 state, The stone the builders had rejected became a cornerstone, showing that the Messiah was rejected by his people, but became the center of the new covenant. Now in Hebrews 10, 1-10, we see the following, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices which are continually offered year after year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? If the worshippers had once been cleansed, they would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin year after year. It is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings thou hast not desired, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings thou hast taken no pleasure. Then I said, Lo, I have come to do thy will, O God, as it is written of me in the roll of the book. When he said above, Thou hast neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings, and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, Lo, I have come to do thy will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second, and by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. End quote. So we see that the blood of animals could not pay off the infinite debt of our sins. These animal sacrifices were all established as a prefigurement, hence they are called shadows of the sacrifice of the divine Messiah on the cross. Since Christ is true God, his sacrifice is infinite in value, and can eternally pay off our debts to God. Since Christ is true man, his sacrifice is applied to humanity. We also see that immediately after Christ the divine Messiah was crucified, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook. Matthew 27, 51. This perfectly matches with the miracle of the crimson thread, as God left the temple and rejected all their sacrifices after they rejected the divine Messiah. So we see that the New Testament account corroborates with this Talmudic admission. Now some rabbis would try to object to this clear evidence against Judaism, and they will claim that God rejected the Jewish sacrifices because so many Jews converted to Christianity. This objection is not only weak, but ridiculous. If we maintain this view, God left the temple, which put an end to the priesthood, and put an end to atonement sacrifices, which led all the quote-unquote faithful Jews to lose their means of atonement for 2,000 years because of some quote-unquote unfaithful apostates. If one takes this course of explanation, it seems to undermine the faithfulness of God to his people. This is an ad hoc explanation put forth by certain rabbis, and it doesn't adequately explain the information provided. On the other hand, we see that the Catholic paradigm can fully explain the Talmudic accounts of the miracle of the Crimson Thread. Furthermore, the Catholic paradigm has a higher prior probability of these events taking place, as temporarily prior to the crucifixion, we already had the Messianic prophecies, which outlined the exact course of events. Furthermore, we have historic evidence of the crucifixion, which matches with these Messianic prophecies, such as Isaiah 53, thus showing how various fields of data are synthesized in our model. Furthermore, our explanation does not lead us to hold the position that God punished the faithful for two millennium rather than the quote-unquote apostates. In other words, the Catholic model has greater explanatory power due to the prior probability, cohesion of data, and simplicity. Part 3. The Daniel 9 prophecy perfectly aligns with the miracle of the crimson thread. Daniel 9, 24-27 reads as follows. 70 weeks of years, or 70 times 7 years, or 490 years, are decreed concerning your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of anointed one, the Mashiach or the Messiah, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the sixty-two weeks, an anointed one, the Mashiach, the Messiah, shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall cause sacrifice and offering to cease. And upon the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Alright, so this prophecy may appear slightly cryptic at first, but let's acknowledge the basic points first before we go deep. The basic points from the prophecies are as follows. 1. After a certain amount of time, 490 years, from a decree to rebuild Jerusalem, sin will be put to an end, and the eternal kingdom will come. 2. The Anointed One, the Messiah, or the Mashiach, will come. 3. The Messiah shall be cut off or killed. 4. The temple and the city shall be destroyed. 5. 
there will be a week or seven year period, and during half the week, sacrifices will cease. Before we get deep, we could already see how this matches our beliefs. The Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, came to bring an end to sin and the eternal kingdom. Christ was killed and resurrected, then the temple was destroyed, and the old covenant sacrifices ended. So we immediately see the cohesion between this set of data and our paradigm. Now that we have the basics down, let's dive a little deeper. The decree to rebuild Jerusalem was set by King Artaxerxes in 457 BC. So 70 weeks of years, or 70 times 7 years, or 490 years, from 457 BC would be just around 33 AD, meaning the Messiah would come and get cut off on 33 AD, which is only fulfilled in Christ. So the Old Testament prophecy, which existed prior to Christ, perfectly predicted his coming. Even liberal scholars believe Daniel was written before Christ, an admission that is sufficient to prove that this is a real prophecy and not a Christian invention. Now this matches perfectly with the dating of the miracle of the Crimson Thread, which acknowledged that starting from 40 years prior to the destruction of the Second Temple, or around 30 AD, God rejected all Old Covenant sacrifices. Again, the Daniel 9 prophecy asserted that the Messiah would be cut off, and that corroborates perfectly with the Isaiah 53 prophecy. So in Daniel 9.24, where it says, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. We see this directly parallels Isaiah 53 11, which says, The righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. So the everlasting righteousness and atonement of sins comes from the death of the suffering servant, who is the Messiah. All the data so far presented matches very well with the Catholic paradigm, and not so well with the rabbi's interpretation. In Daniel 9 27, we see, And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week, he shall cause sacrifice and offering to cease. Now the seven years or the one week period here is in reference to the Jewish Roman War, which lasted seven years, spanning from 66 to 73 AD. So when the scripture says, for half of the week he shall cause sacrifice and offering to cease, this means in the middle of the seven year period, or half of the week, the sacrifices would cease. Guess what? Smack dab in the middle of the seven year period of the Jewish Roman War is 70 AD, because between 66 and 73 AD is 70 AD, the date that the temple was destroyed. Exactly like the scriptures predicted, God put an end to the sacrifice by destroying the temple in 70 AD, or in half the week. So we see this prophecy not only predicts the coming of Christ perfectly and his death and the very date of the destruction of the temple, but we also see that the Talmud agrees with the turn of events and the dating. So the prior probability of the miracle of the crimson thread being the result of the Jews' rejection of the Messiah increases with the Daniel 9 prophecy, and the cohesion of data also increases the explanatory power of the Catholic framework. The Jewish interpretation does not synthesize any of these truths. The probability that so many prophecies can all align and be coherent and be historically reliable is a sign that the Jewish interpretation is false and that the Catholic paradigm is correct. Now let's move on to Rabbi Rashi's interpretation of the Daniel 9 prophecy. Rabbi Rashi is like the St. Thomas Aquinas of Judaism. Wikipedia states that Rashi's commentary on the Talmud continues to be a key basis for contemporary rabbinic scholarship and interpretation. Without Rashi's commentary, the Talmud would have remained a closed book. Here's what Rabbi Rashi has to say about Daniel 9, 24-27 and the dating of the prophecy. He says, quote, Their transgressions should terminate, their sins should end, and their iniquity should be expiated, in order to bring upon them eternal righteousness, and to anoint upon them the Holy of Holies, the Ark, the Altars, and the Holy Vessels which they will bring to them through the King Messiah. The number of 70 weeks is 490 years. For one week, he will promise them the strengthening of a covenant and peace for seven years. But within the seven years, he will abrogate his covenant. End quote. So we see that Rabbi Rashi agrees Daniel 9 is about the Messiah and the dating for the 70 weeks of years is 490 years. He also agrees that the Messiah would come to expiate sins. Furthermore, Rashi agrees that the week at the end of the prophecy is interpreted as seven years, and he asserts that in the middle of the seven years, the covenant will be abrogated. So Rabbi Rashi shows that the numbers we used above are not merely Christian fabrications, but an interpretation that is affirmed by top Jewish theologians. Now some rabbis see that the Daniel 9 prophecy perfectly matches with the dating of Christ, but they will try to avoid believing Christ is the Messiah. Hence they will assert that the Daniel 9 prophecy refers to Cyrus' decree to rebuild the temple in 538 BC. Now there are two problems with this. First, the Daniel 9 prophecy says, from the going forth of the word to restore and build Jerusalem. So the prophecy itself is with regard to the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, not the temple, as the rabbis assert. Problem number two, if Cyrus's decree is the dating of Daniel 9, then the Messiah had already come, been cut off, and established the everlasting righteousness, which the rabbis don't assert. 
So either God and his scriptures had failed, or the rabbis are wrong. If the rabbis actually hold this interpretation, they implicitly undermine their entire religion. So we see the ad hoc Jewish interpretation of Daniel 9 undermines the scriptures, whereas the Catholic framework manages to synthesize and interweave all this data from the Old Testament, New Testament, and Talmud. For those who are still unconvinced, we shall continue our cumulative case approach. We finish with stage 3 here and move on by showing that the Talmud itself says that the Messianic age had passed without a Messiah, meaning that prophecies predicted the Messiah would come already. Such a confession is devastating for the Jewish position and increases the probability that the Christian dating of Daniel 9 is correct. Part 4. The Talmud admits the Messianic age has passed. You might have questioned our dating of the Daniel 9 prophecy, but I wouldn't dismiss this so quickly. Let's examine what the rabbis in the Talmud have to say regarding the dating of the Messianic Age. Maybe that will help convince you that our dating was right. In Sanhedrin 97a14 and 97b1, we see the following is said. The school of Eliyahu taught, 6,000 years is the duration of the world. 2,000 of the 6,000 years are characterized by chaos. 2,000 years are characterized by Torah, from the era of the patriarchs until the end of the Mishnaic period. And 2,000 years are the period of the coming of the Messiah. That is the course that history was to take. But due to our sins, that time frame increased. The Messiah did not come after 4,000 years passed. And furthermore, the years that elapsed since then, which were to have been the Messianic era, have elapsed. End quote. Wait a second, did you hear that? The Jews thought the world was going to be divided up into three sections. 2,000 years of chaos, 2,000 years of Torah, and 2,000 years of the Messiah. They admit that their predicted Messianic age has passed, but they don't think the Messiah showed up due to their sins. Coincidentally, their predicted messianic age matches perfectly with Christ. The era of the patriarch started with Abraham, and the time between Abraham and Christ is just about 2,000 years. Is this another coincidence, or is it providence? What's more likely, that the scriptures which are true words of God somehow were falsified, or that the true words of God were fulfilled? If you think God is faithful to his word, then you should reject the modern Jewish interpretation and accept Catholicism. It's as simple as that. Let's continue. Sanhedrin 97b 9 says the following, quote, Rabbi Shmuel bar Nehemani says that Rabbi Yonatan says, May those who calculate the end of the days be cursed, as they would say once the end of the days that they had calculated arrived and the Messiah did not come, that he would no longer come at all. Rather, the proper behavior is to continue to wait for his coming, as it is stated, though it tarry, wait for it, lest you say we are expectantly awaiting the end of the days and the Holy One, blessed be he, is not awaiting the end of the days and does not want to redeem his people. The verse states, and therefore will the Lord wait to be gracious to you, and therefore will he be exalted to have mercy upon you. For the Lord is God of judgment. Happy are all they who wait for him. So the Jews are anathema if they try to calculate the coming of the Messiah, namely from the Old Testament prophecies, since their calculation date arrived and the Messiah did not show up. So they should just keep waiting and act like the scriptures can now somehow be fulfilled, even though they admit that the dating for the fulfillment of these prophecies have already passed. These admissions from the Talmud match perfectly with our previous conclusions regarding the Daniel 9 prophecy dating, as well as matching it with the miracle of the Crimson Thread and other Messianic prophecies, showing our calculation for the Messianic prophecies are correct and biblical. What's more likely, the fact that your God-breathed scriptures were wrong and will somehow change and be fulfilled in the future, or the fact that your God-breathed scriptures were right since they're God-breathed? In other words, did God fail or did you fail in accepting God? Part 5, The Talmud and the Historicity of Jesus Christ Sanhedrin 43a20 says the following, But isn't it taught in a bereta, on Passover Eve, they hung the corpse of Jesus the Nazarene after they killed him by way of stoning. And a crier went out before him for 40 days, publicly proclaiming, Jesus the Nazarene is going out to be stoned because he practiced sorcery, incited people to idol worship, and led the Jewish people astray. Anyone who knows of a reason to, to acquit him should come forward and teach it on his behalf. And the court did not find a reason to acquit him. And so they stoned him and hung his corpse on Passover Eve. So we see here in the Talmud that the Jews affirm that Christ Jesus existed and was killed, and his corpse was hung on Passover Eve, or Good Friday. Now obviously they are incorrect about the stoning and other details, but we see that their admission directly contradicts the position of Jesus' mythicism. Furthermore, many of the small details in these Talmudic accounts match with the Gospel accounts, therefore showing the reliability of the New Testament. Remember, Matthew 12, 24 says, quote, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. End quote. So the Gospel's account of the Jews are completely accurate and are not mere fabrications. The Pharisees in the Gospel claim that Christ is casting out the demons by Beelzebub, and in the Talmud, they're claiming that Christ practiced sorcery. Furthermore, the Jews do not deny that Christ is performing miracles. They just accuse him of sorcery, implicitly affirming the reality of his supernatural actions. 
So the Talmud shows that Christ truly existed, had powers beyond what is natural, was killed, and his corpse was hung on Passover Eve. Let's continue surveying the Talmudic account of Christ. Shabbat 104b, verses 5-6, to says the following, quote, It was taught in a Bereta that Rabbi Eliezer said to the rabbis, Didn't the infamous Ben Stada take magic spells out of Egypt in a scratch on his flesh? They said to him, He was a fool and you cannot cite proof from a fool. That is not the way that most people write. Incidentally, the Gemara asks, Why did they call him Ben Stada when he was the son of Pandaria? Rav Hizda said his mother's husband, who acted as his father's, was named Stada, but the one who had relations with his mother and fathered him was named Pandira. The Gemara asks, Wasn't his mother's husband Papos Ben Yehuda? Rather, his mother was named Stada, and he was named Ben Stada after her? The Gemara asks, But wasn't his mother Miriam, who braided women's hair? The Gemara explains, That is not a contradiction. Rather, Stada was merely a nickname. As they said in Pumbedita, this one strayed from her husband. Before moving on, it's important to recognize that the Ben Stada character mentioned here refers to Christ. So the Talmud clearly blasphemes Christ and his holy mother. But in doing so, they concede some details regarding the life of Christ, which are found in the New Testament. First, they accuse Christ of taking magic spells out of Egypt, which is false and blasphemous. But it implicitly admits a supernatural aspect to Christ, similar to the previous Talmudic passage. They attribute Christ's supernatural actions to the devil, like the Pharisees do in the Gospels. Once again, this data coincides with our paradigm. Furthermore, they admit that Christ came out of Egypt, which perfectly matches with the Gospel account of the Holy Family fleeing to Egypt and returning from it, thus once again demonstrating the reliability of the New Testament. Finally, they accuse Christ's mother Miriam, the Blessed Virgin Mary, of committing adultery, which is false and blasphemous. But this accusation directly parallels what the Jews in John's Gospel say. In John 8.41, we see the following, quote, they said therefore to him, We are not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. End quote. So once again, we see that the Pharisees and the Talmudic Jews make the same assertions, which again corroborates with the Catholic paradigm. The Talmud greatly attests to the historicity of Christ, and their insults match perfectly with the gospel depiction of the Pharisees, showing the reliability of the New Testament. Barakat 17b 1-2 says the following, We should not have a child or a student who overcooks his food in public, who sins in public and causes others to sin, as in the well-known case of Jesus the Nazarene, end quote. The Talmud claims Christ caused people to sin in public, which matches with the gospel account of the Pharisees in Mark 2, 24, quote, and the Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath, end quote. So this blasphemous book attests to the historicity of Christ and concedes facts which match perfectly with the gospel accounts. Now I can already imagine the objection that none of this proves the historicity of Christ. Now if you were consistent, your objection undermines the authority of your own book, which decreases the probability of your worldview and indirectly increases the probability of ours. Furthermore, the historicity of Christ is not dependent on the Talmud. Rather, we're simply showing that even if we play in the opposition's turf, we can still make a case for a paradigm, thus strengthening our case. Part 6, The Talmud on the Messiah. Sukkah 52a verse 2 says the following, quote, The Gemara asks, Granted, according to the one who said that the lament is for Messiah ben Yosef, who was killed, this would be the meaning of, of that which is written in that context, and they shall look unto me, because they have thrust him through, and they shall mourn for him, as one mourns for his only son. Zechariah 12.10 And Sukkah 52a verse 6 says the following, The sages taught to Messiah ben David, who is destined to be revealed swiftly in our time. The Holy One, blessed be he, says, Ask of me anything, and I will give you whatever you wish. As it is stated, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said unto me, You are my son, this day have I begotten you. Ask of me, and I have given the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Psalm 2, verses 7 to 8. So the rabbis in the Talmud believed there were two messiahs, one being the suffering servant and the other being the exalted king. The first was called Messiah ben Yosef, or son of Joseph, as seen in Sukkah 52a, verse 2. And they apply Zechariah 12, 10 to him, which we also think is a messianic prophecy that proves the divinity of the pierced messiah, as it is the Lord himself talking. The second messiah is the exalted messiah, which is Messiah ben David, or son of David, as seen in Sukkah 52a6, and Psalm 2 is applied to the exalted Messiah, showing God begat him. Although the Jews were wrong about two separate messiahs, interestingly enough, Christ is both the son of David and the son of Joseph. Is this just a coincidence? And as Christians, we apply both Psalm 2 to the eternal begetting of the Son of God and Zechariah 12.10 to the piercing of the divine Messiah, which matches with the Talmudic interpretation. Furthermore, Christ is both the suffering servant by his crucifixion and the exalted king by his ascension, which these two Talmudic messiahs are striving to portray. Additionally, 
Whenever someone in the gospel acknowledges the divinity and superiority of Christ, they refer to him as son of David. Take, for example, Luke 18.38, which says, And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Whenever they doubt Christ and only see him as a mere human, they call him son of Joseph. For example, we see in Luke 4.22, All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. So although the Jews in the Talmud were wrong about two messiahs, we can see that their inferences from the Old Testament all come to the completeness in the hypostatic union. Furthermore, this shows that just using the Old Testament alone supports the belief of a Messiah who is a suffering servant and an exalted begotten Son of God. And the New Testament perfectly completes these prophecies. Part 7. The Eucharist In Midrash Ve'ikra, Rabbah 9.7, we see the following said, Rabbi Pinchas, Rabbi Levi, and Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Menachem from Galia, in the time to come, all sacrifices will be annulled, but the sacrifice of thanksgiving will not be annulled. Interestingly enough, as Catholics, we have the sacrifice of thanksgiving, or the Eucharistic sacrifice. So we see that the suffering servant, who is the Messiah, came to die for our sins, and we were made righteous by his sacrifice. We see that the Old Testament prophecies perfectly predict the exact date of the crucifixion and the destruction of the temple. We see that the Talmud attests to the Old Covenant sacrifices being rejected at the exact same time Christ came. Furthermore, we see that the Talmud tells us that the Messianic Age has come and passed, and that the Messiah is the son of Joseph and the son of David, and that he is pierced for our sins and that he is the only begotten Son of God. All of this is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. If you want your sins to be forgiven so you could avoid the fires of hell, you must accept Jesus as Christ and Lord and repent and be baptized in the Catholic Church. In short, Judaism is wrong insofar as they reject the Messiah. Become Catholic. Remember, Vatican II in Lumen Gentium 14 says, Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or to remain in it, could not be saved. If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. If there are any errors in this video, I submit to Holy Mother Church, which guides all men to the fullness of truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here are some resources used in this video. Roy Schumann's book, Salvation is from the Jews, Reason and Theology's video on the miracle of the Crimson Thread, and safaria.org. Here are some images used in my video. Thanks for watching. Let's close in a Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen.